Hi friends, this is Justin from Why Catholic. I really appreciate everyone who has donated to keep this podcast going. And so I thought, wouldn't it be great if people could support this podcast, but also get something in return? So I created a Why Catholic merch shop. You can find it on Etsy. Just search for Why Catholic. And I've also linked to it in the show notes. These designs are 100% original. I wanted to make something that shares our faith, but also looks trendy. You can find t-shirts, hats, sweatshirts, and more. And I'm constantly adding to the store as well. Stay tuned to the end of the podcast to hear how you can get a special discount. Thanks so much for supporting Why Catholic. Hi, this is Justin Hibbert, and you're listening to Why Catholic, my podcast about the what and why of Catholicism. We are in the middle of our series on the Sacrament of Holy Orders. In episode 38, I talked about the Jewish roots of Holy Orders. Then in episode 39, we dove into the apostolic succession, particularly focusing on how Jesus passed down his authority to his apostles, and they passed it down to church leaders called bishops, a process that continues to happen to this day. Since Holy Orders pertains to the office of bishops, priests, and deacons, I thought it would be best if we could hear from a priest as well as a deacon. And so these next two episodes are going to be a little bit of background, but mostly an interview with a priest and a deacon. Before I dive into my interview today with Father John Paul Kern, I want to preface it by discussing the office of presbyter or priest. When we look at the New Testament, we see a number of terms that are used fluidly and somewhat interchangeably, overseer, elder, pastor, deacon, etc., By the early 2nd century, we see that these offices had clear distinctions and roles. Around 110 AD, St. Ignatius of Antioch stated in his letter to the Magnesians, quote, Take care to do all things in harmony with God, with the bishop presiding in the place of God, and with the presbyters in the place of the council of the apostles, and with the deacons who are most dear to me, entrusted with the business of Jesus Christ, who was with the Father from the beginning, and is at last made manifest, end quote. In his letter to the Tralians around the same time, St. Ignatius of Antioch wrote, quote, It is necessary, therefore, and such is your practice, that you do nothing without the bishop, and that you be subject also to the presbytery, as to the apostles of Jesus Christ our hope, in whom we shall be found if we live in him. It is necessary also that the deacons, the dispensers of the mysteries of Jesus Christ, be in every way pleasing to all men, end quote. In the Stromata, written around 208, St. Clement of Alexandria wrote, quote, Even here in the church, the gradations of bishops, presbyters, and deacons happen to be imitations, in my opinion, of the angelic glory and of that arrangement which the scriptures say awaits those who have followed in the footsteps of the apostles and who have lived in complete righteousness according to the gospel, end quote. Protestants will often make the claim that Catholic offices of bishops and priests, and thus the apostolic succession, are an invention because we don't see them clearly defined in Scripture. However, we do see the beginnings of these offices in Scripture, and as we might expect, as the church grew and matured, these roles became more and more defined. When we consider the record of early church history, we see a clear development of the role of priests very early on in the church. While the apostles appointed regional leaders, which eventually became known as bishops, the church grew to a point where the bishops could not pastor the entire region by themselves. So in order to effectively administer the sacraments and attend to the needs of the local church communities, bishops appointed presbyters or priests and gave them authority to perform some of their functions. Most people do not have a relationship with their bishop because their bishop is so busy administering and overseeing all the activities in a large region. Most people are familiar with their priests because it's their priest that they see on a weekly or even daily basis. He's the one pastoring the parish, leading mass, hearing confessions, performing baptisms, weddings, and funerals. With one bishop for a large region, we see how invaluable the role of the priest is. Today, we're going to hear from a priest, Father John Paul Kern. Father John Paul and I graduated from Annapolis Area Christian School in Annapolis, Maryland. I was a couple of years ahead of him. And we both converted to Catholicism, though Father John Paul did so in 2006, about 15 years before me. Father John Paul earned degrees in mechanical engineering and nuclear engineering from Penn State University and worked as a reactor inspector for the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Father John Paul entered the Order of Dominicans in 2012 and was ordained to the priesthood in 2019. Father John Paul served as a Catholic chaplain at the University of Louisville and now resides in New York City, where he currently serves as the executive director of the Dominican Friars Foundation, as well as the director of the Rosary Shrine of St. Jude in Washington, D.C. 
Father John Paul is also busy preparing for the Dominican Rosary Pilgrimage, which will occur on September 30th, 2023. In this interview, you'll get to hear Father John Paul's story, and he'll explain why he chose to enter the priesthood, specifically the religious order of the Dominicans. He'll also explain some of the differences between a Dominican priest and a diocesan priest. A funny thing about Father John Paul, I only remember him vaguely from high school, but we connected on Facebook a number of years ago. And then as I was becoming Catholic, I discovered he was connected with a number of people I was meeting in Catholic circles. In the interview, you'll hear some other surprise connections. So without further ado, here's my interview with Father John Paul Kern. Well, thank you so much, Father John Paul, for joining us for the Why Catholic Podcast. I really appreciate it. My pleasure, Justin. Thank you. Now, um, this episode is about the Sacrament of Holy Orders and specifically about what it's like being a priest and really looking forward to hearing your perspective. But I, I want to take a step back and go back to your upbringing because you grew up in a Protestant home. So tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So I was baptized Lutheran and uh, grew up with uh, two devout parents who really uh, taught me to love the Bible, to love Jesus. And we ended up uh, then going to more of a non-denominational church for a while. Are you familiar with uh, the Evangelical Presbyterian Church, which is sort yeah. of, uh, you know, it's, it's got some kind of confessional Protestant roots to it, but it's also got a lot of more non-denominational elements. So went through that for middle school and high school. And uh, it was actually in college in the midst of searching and exploring <laughs> Uh, many, many things in life, as people do in college, that there was a period in time where I was actually going to, I think, a different church just about every Sunday for a while. And it was like I was I was seeing even more than the non-denominational school uh, breadth of flavors of Christianity. I was I was seeing even more. And uh, yeah, it was it was during that time of searching that uh, the Lord definitely was calling me to follow him. And what was interesting is my my first sort of uh, wrestling with him was just in sort of converting, converting to really uh, committing to follow him and not just keeping him a little bit more on Sundays. And then as I began to do that, I felt he was calling me to something more. I did not know where it would lead. <laughs> like, like like Abraham, I was, you know, the Lord saying, come follow me. And I was like, okay, to, to just kind of practicing my faith a little bit more. Uh, turns out, um, yeah, there was actually before before really coming to, to explore the Catholic church and consider it, there was another wrestling match over even being open to doing some kind of ministry. And, uh, you know, I thought this may be some kind of missionary work, perhaps becoming a pastor or, you know, part-time. Um, but my background was in science. So I studied mechanical and nuclear engineering in college. And in, in my kind of getting back into the faith and, and leading some Bible studies and doing outreaches and things, I remember that uh, I was struck at one point in that we would we'd be, you know, sort of uh, teaching or sharing the faith to a group of people. And with, with great uh, confidence, um, the Protestant leader would say, you know, this is what the word of God says. This is what the Bible says with great conviction and, and belief. And then sort of stepping behind the curtain with the other Protestant leaders and those who are interested in becoming pastors there was a lot of agree to disagree and that we realized is as much as one of us might say this with conviction, even among ourselves, there was actually great disagreement on exactly what that was. And so certainly there was a real sense of faith and belief that was authentic though, uh, that was there. However, on the other hand, to do that to me as like a scientist was kind of shocking because if you did that at a scientific conference and you said with great conviction, this is what the data says, or this is what uh, has been proven as a, a scientific law, and then you step behind the curtain and actually all the scientists completely disagree. People would say like, what the, what the, what the heck? This is, this is your opinion. How can you stand on this truth? And uh, we're obviously talking about something way more important here with eternal truth and salvation. And so that was something that made me question. I mean, I, I, I had faith that there was some amount of truth that was there, that God was working and that people were sincerely seeking him. But that definitely got me a, uh, searching a little bit, a little bit deeper, uh, and, and asking some questions. And in the midst of that, I was, I was open to, <laughs> I wouldn't have even have 
if you would have asked me if I'm open to the Catholic Church at that time, I probably would have said no. But I was open to perhaps more historical Christianity. You know, we all, hopefully as, as Christians, we all want to have that great zeal of the apostles and the early Christians. You know, you you hear of them, you know, being martyred for the faith, for standing up in the midst of persecution, for living very closely to those who met Christ. And there's something that we all want in, in our relationship with God that is like that. And so there, there was something that, that got me seeking a little bit, um, <laughs> maybe a more radical form of following the Lord or, or considering some, some historical uh, forms of Christianity that, uh, well, yeah, you, you, you seek and you find, the Lord makes that promise to you. And so, uh, yeah, he led me into the church, praise the Lord. You know, I, in thinking about what you're saying here about looking at the early church history, I don't, I, I'm curious if you had a similar experience as me, because, you know, I grew up in a Christian home. I went to uh, we went to the same Christian school together, Christian high school. <laughs> together. Um, I went to a Christian college and it was in I don't think I ever really learned about the early church fathers. Like I remember kind of a a brief survey of Christianity in college that where I was introduced to um, certain saints that I had never heard of. And, and, but, but just snippets, like little quotes here and there. Um, it, it wasn't until like in my own journey and my own searching where I'm actually reading the, the writings of guys like Justin Martyr and Tertullian and, um, and Irenaeus and, and really considering not just like little snippets of what they're saying, but the whole swath of their doctrine. And, and it was really eye-opening. Was that, was that a similar experience or did you have more exposure to uh, early Christianity than I did? No, no, a, a similar experience as, as so many that have walked the path before us and continue to find the church. You know, I, 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 I probably pride myself as being a pretty knowledgeable Protestant in that in a certain sense, in early high school, I had this instinct of, and actually this is interesting because I was baptized Lutheran, was going to this evangelical Presbyterian uh, high school. And then there were kind of various other flavors of Protestantism. And it was like, well, some of them have a lot of energy, but they're not so serious about some aspects of the truth maybe, or, or, or wanting to define doctrines, we'll say. And again, that, that part of me that was seeking the truth, I went back to what I consider to be the fathers at the time, which were Protestants, like, well, Calvin and Luther. And so I, I actually read a lot of Calvin and Luther and Calvin, uh, it, it can get a little dark sometimes, but there is a certain like logical precision that's there that you kind of like, you know, I'm like, this is like a mathematical tr proof here that fits together very, very beautifully if you accept all the assumptions. Um, but uh, and, and Luther as well. So I, I, I thought, oh, I have a grasp of this. And I've seen all these different um, Protestant denominations, but there was no, I think if you would have asked me in high school, I would have had this common misperception that American Protestants would have that most of Christian history was after 1500 and most Christians in the world are Protestant, which is actually, you know, if, if I, if I had to uh, like a few anecdotes here that are amazing. So um I remember at one point, my my little sister went to Houghton. Uh, That's, right, went. That's where I went. You went to Houghton. Ah! <laughs> okay. Well, and so this this hit me. This is like, um, I this is something after my conversion. I saw that reminded me how I used to see things, and it was just so blatant in my face. And that, you know, after opening up their church fathers and reading again, you know, the first things that they wrote. Um, you know, and, and seeing the scope of, of 2000 years of history, I go to visit my sister at Houghton and we're walking in the chapel and there's this like mural above the chapel. And it was exactly the way that I had imagined history as a Protestant and that you're, you're like, okay, we have Jesus and the apostles. And then somebody is like being fed to the lions. So you're kind of like eh, first, second centuries here. And then suddenly like somebody's being burnt at the stake and it's kind of murky. And you're like, is this like a proto-Protestant, early Protestant thing in the 14th, 15th centuries, 16th centuries? And then you maybe have, I don't know who else they threw in there, but kind of some of the Protestant greats, like maybe you had a, a John Wesley, like after Luther, a John Wesley, and maybe somebody else like in America doing something. But it was like, yep, that, that that's basically it. And you don't realize there's like, you know, 14, 1500 years missing there that 
is 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 a lot. Um, and and for me also, I had this moment. So I, I'd actually I dated for a little while my senior year of high school a Catholic girl, and uh, I was asking probably too many questions, and her parents were like frustrated with me, and so they you know her mom takes this like dusty catechism off the shelf. It's like, you want the answers? Boom, here you go. And I'm like, <laughs> well, again, what, what, what are these Catholics? Like, they can't explain the faith to me, but they just give me this book with all these like things in it. Um, which again, this is part of the reality of the faith. It's a Catholic church is huge. You have people who are really knowledgeable. You have people who are not so much. You have crazy uncles, you have saints. You got everybody in there. And uh, it's a big tent. You know, oh yeah, it's a huge set. Um, <laughs> I remember like like going through the catechism and actually taking notes on what I agreed and disagreed with um, and very humbling. I think my mom still has some of these like notes in her basement somewhere, uh, which is hilarious. Um, but going through there, it's like I there were certain things that jumped out that I was like, it's a different perspective. When when the catechism talks about the faith, they're not saying, well, we, we read the scriptures and here's what we believe. And so here's how we're going to build the church. It's like, you're like, well, this is, we were founded by Christ and he gave us this. And so this is what we're doing. And it's just the family inheritance. This is the way it's, it's been. And, uh, and years later, when I was diving into some of these early church fathers that I didn't know existed, I had no idea that we have writings from these people that met the apostles and the people that were taught by them. And as I'm reading this, I remember like stopping and just being like, these guys it's like they're quoting the catechism. And then I realized the catechism was quoting these guys. This, this is like the faith that's been passed on from the guys who met the apostles and their disciples. And that was, you know, I uh, tried, tried to fight that, but that, that was definitely a losing battle there. Um, you know, it's like, yep, this is, this is the faith of the apostles that was passed on right away. And it was so opening to me and, and very humbling. Did, did you have the experience too of being humbled in a way of, of kind of, you know, think, thinking you had a good grasp on things and the things you thought you knew the most, suddenly you, your your eyes are opened and it's a whole new perspective. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good way to put it. I, I like felt like I had egg on my face, you know, like <laughs> I, I, I had, I, you know, because I, I would love to, I would love to quote like St. Augustine and I would be like, um, our hearts are restless until we find our rest in thee, you know, like, and, and I love that. It all resonated with me. And then I read some of his other stuff and I'm like, oh, he he was very Catholic, you know, and, and, and like, what would he say about my beliefs? What would he say about me saying, oh, the, the Eucharist, that's just symbolic, you know, um, I, I read some of these, some of these church fathers and some of the things they said about people who had these fringe beliefs, like Justin Martyr, for example. And I'm like, I, I, would, have, I would have been out there with Arius and like the heretics, you know what I mean? And, and, uh, and it was really humbling. It's like, I can't pick and choose what, like, what, you know, like I was, I really recognized that I was the one picking and choosing those quotes that I agreed with and just sort of whitewashing everything else that, um, that didn't fit with, with, with my theology. Yes. I, I would say it was also very eye-opening as, as I was starting to get into this, it was eye-opening to me to see not only me, but, um, so at the time that I was really getting into this, I was leading a, a campus crusade Bible study for, I think Athletes in Action was the name of their group. So we were, you know, having a Bible study here. And uh, and I started mentioning like, you know, I, I think actually the Catholic church might be right about some things here. And I get kind of like called before the, the campus crusade non-denominational tribunal. And, uh, you know, it's like, we, we accept all things in our big tent of Christianity, except for like that really historical thing. Um, but I remember talking to the guy who was in charge for Penn State where I went. And uh, and so we're talking and I'm like, I remember telling my friend, you know, like, look, I'm just going to tell him what, what I found. And so I like point to something in the Bible and I'm like, this seems pretty straightforward to me. Something like John six, you're like, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life within you. And I'm like, so literally this seems to be saying something within Christianity, most Christians for all times clearly believe this thing. Uh, I, I've been researching, and because uh, part of this Bible study was actually for non-Christians, of kind of like bringing them into the faith. So we were talking about like historical evidence that Jesus existed outside of the biblical record and other things about, you know, sort of that research. And I'm like, 
Well, actually, it turns out like the more I'm digging around in that early phase, the more really Catholic everything is. And, uh, you know, so, so, so I'm like, so, so what do you say to this? Like, and, uh, and his response was, oh, um, you know, I, I, I had a class on the church fathers uh, when I was in seminary. Um, yeah. But like we left that meeting and I, I told my friends, like, there's not going to be another meeting because he if he digs up his class notes or he reads anything, it's not going to be anything but Catholic. Um, and, and it's and it's 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 a it's an amazing thing that um, I guess maybe one of the tragedies of kind of the uh, the splitting in the branches of Christianity is that some parts that have broken off that, again, the church talks about, like the sin of schism would be those who first broke off. But then those who, through no fault of their own, are baptized in this part of the church that's not in full communion with the Catholic Church, and they come to understand and love God in some way and follow him the best that they can, you know, those people are not of their own guilty of that sin of schism. They're, they're kind of ignorant in a certain way, but it's kind of sad that they can be so ignorant of most of what is their family heritage, you know, um, and, and that almost what should be most native to them seems a little bit uh, alien. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I've shared this on this podcast before, but one of the conversations I had that sort of stirred that uh, in me, in me was a conversation with a Mormon who, who was saying, oh, I, you know, we, you know, I'm, I, I'm asking questions like, well, where does that belief come from? And why do you believe that? And it was just a very friendly conversation. And she said, oh, well, we believe in what's called the great apostasy. And it's basically that, that, from the death of the apostles onward, we're just, we're calling everything apostate, you know, and, 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 and that's, and you sort of have to do that to arrive at your, uh, at this belief system that doesn't look anything like that early record of Christianity. So you kind of pick and choose pieces in the Bible and say, oh, this means this, and this means this, but, you know, so much of the Bible is the, there's, there's 30,000 denominations, Protestant denominations. And that's kind of proof that the Bible is, uh, we can all read the Bible and kind of come up with our own things. And I think reading the church fathers is so enlightening in that, oh, that's, you know, Clement, Clement heard Paul say, or Peter say this, and that's why he believes this. And that's, you know, in that apostolic teaching that was passed down. Yeah. Yeah, the great St. Irenaeus in his Against Heresies has that line, right? And it's like he's almost talking to somebody who's say, saying, hey, how can we bring back these wandering brethren? He says, well, don't don't try to just quote scripture them because they can quote scripture to say whatever they want. And that's not going to settle anything. Every heretic has its own interpretation. But what do you do? Ask them, well, where did you get that tradition? Where did you get that interpretation? Who gave it to you? And he said, every true church can say, well... We were given to it by so-and-so, who was given to it by so-and-so, and it came from the apostles. And every true church can trace its lineage down and say, we're, we're holding, you know, tradition literally just means handing on. We didn't make up this truth. We're holding on to what was handed on to us. We were not the origin of this, but we just received it, and we continue to live this mm -hmm. truth. Yeah, that was so eye-opening for episode 39 that I just did on the apostolic mm -hmm. succession. Um, you know, I, I, it, when I was doing the research and, you know, because I was reading, I, I read Eusebius's church history before I, um, before I kind of, or in my, in the process of thinking about Catholicism. And one thing that really stood out to me was how many heresies were popping up. You know, we hear about the big ones like Arianism and things like that, but just heresy after heresy after heresy. And then you had people popping up all over the place saying like, I'm the bishop, I'm the bishop of this place. I'm the bishop of this place. And then, and like you said, like Irene, Irene says is like, you just ask them one simple question by like, where is that? Where is your apostolic authority and tradition? You know, and, and that it, it wasn't, how you know, how did you get to that interpretation of scripture or what scripture is your proof or, or anything like that? It was simply where where does where can you trace that idea? Where can you trace your authority back to the apostles? It's just like you said. <laughs> you, your uh, your reference to the early church situation reminded me of driving down 16th Street in Washington D.C., where if you you go down there, you see almost every single flavor of church, and some of them have cool titles. You're like, and on the right we have the third 
true apostolic church of Reverend Bishop Apostle uh, <laughs> Doctor Isaiah the Third, and you're like, <laughs> who, who, who the heck gave you that authority? Right. Um, you know, you're like, you, you look online, you're like, this guy just founded this church like 20 years ago. Um, you know, and some of them have more of the American genius. You know, they're kind of franchised like a McDonald's. They've just kind of got spread all over. Others have a little bit deeper roots and kind of get closer. But uh, it, it is kind of a wild scene when you just look at this. You're like, this is this is very confusing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's a it's a very, you know, if you think about it, it's a very unbiblical idea. The idea that you could just kind of pop up and say, I, I'm the, I have authority, I'm in charge, where we see in scripture, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, that uh, that that spiritual authority was bestowed. It was not something you grabbed. It was something bestowed, and Jesus bestows it onto his apostles, and his apostles bestow it onto Matthias and onto the deacons and so on and so forth. <laughs> I Another humbling moment in, in, my, in my searching and journey, it's funny, before I came to, I think what on the map most people would consider is a, a very traditional form of Christianity, which certainly 2000 years of tradition founded by Christ himself. Yes, that is true tradition. But a lot of times for Protestants, like they'll look at just the externals and be like, okay, it's, it's, it's older, or it has kind of a, a liturgical or a Latin-y type thing. So that makes it traditional. But the way I came in was actually more of the, the radical route, which probably would have either led me to like some crazy, crazy commune or the true church. Fortunately, it led to the latter. But, uh, you know, look, looking at the evangelical councils, you're like, this is radical. You know, Jesus tells this rich young man to sell all of his stuff and just like come follow him. And like, how's he, how's he going to take care of his, his family responsibilities? Oh, shoot. Well, he's also telling the apostles, you know, well, like, yeah, there's marriage. There's also something else if you're open to it. Uh, it's kind of radical, though. You know, you got to celibacy for the kingdom of heaven. Uh we're opening the eyes a little bit. And uh, so, so it's like, I was kind of, it's like, I can't find any form of Protestant Christianity that, that does this really. Um, and I don't know about, you know, Catholic stuff and all, maybe, maybe God is fought, you know, for a moment, maybe God is calling me to, I don't know, I think I would call it found a church, but just kind of like follow him and start some movement of following him in this radical, very literally living the gospel way. And uh and no mercy, but there were a couple, there were a couple of good moments there when I was one thinking of just like the last thing they need is like a church with my name on it, like all these other ones that have popped up. It's like that, that this is this is not the path to God. And uh and there were a couple of moments too in humility, which getting to the topic of the priesthood, this is something where even before I was diving very deep in the, into the church fathers and then really starting to see where, oh yeah, the priesthood is huge. Um, on a practical note, when a friend of mine and I who are on this journey, we're just saying, you know, well, we're trying to follow the Lord in this radical way. We don't know where we fit denominationally or what, or what God's calling us to do, but say we're just sharing the, you know, sharing the love of God with somebody and they're like, great, I want to become a Christian too. He's like, well, what do we do? What church do we send them to? Like, or what if we're traveling and like, you know, on a missionary journey or something, we don't know who to plug them into because we, you know, we're kind of wandering ourselves. Where are we going to go? And it was like, well, I think I'd feel comfortable baptizing that person if they like converted on the spot. I think I would feel comfortable with that. Um, as far as where I plug them into, though, that that's that's a real question. And then also the one thing, you know, I remember like having this conversation where we're sitting there like reading the Bible or having lunch. I'm like looking at like a piece of bread from my sandwich and it's like, I don't know what it is, but I, there's something more there and I do not feel comfortable picking up the bread and saying those words of the Lord, because it seems like it's a really big deal when you listen to St. Paul, um, you know, basically uh, acknowledge the true body and blood of the Lord, or you might uh, die. Um <laughs> spiritually and otherwise um yeah there was just always something there that it was like no 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 you you it would it'd be the equivalent of i guess a uh, some jewish person in the old covenant being like well i <laughs> you know i wasn't really trained by my rabbi or somebody um where i haven't really been properly prepared for this but i'm going to walk into the holy of holies and just kind of see how it goes you're like whoa <laughs> <laughs> 
not 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 a good life decision there, Bucko. <laughs> um, that, that's probably not going to go so well. Uh, you, you don't just waltz up there and tell God how you're going to be doing what He has instituted. Uh, he has instituted it, and there there are ways that He's given authorities in preparation to make sure that we are giving you know right worship to Him as He is is asked for. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, you made this decision. I. I I think we said 2007, is that correct, to, to enter the Catholic Church? Yeah, so I entered the Easter Vigil of 2006. And, 2006. Uh, yeah, it was about 2005, end of my undergrad, that I was, uh, yeah, I was wrestling with the Lord, and he definitely won. And, uh, you know, and then suddenly it was like, well, I'm graduating, and so my my next move is that i got to figure out how to become Catholic, and <laughs> we'll see where that goes. How did your friends and family, I mean, you, you come from a Protestant background, Lutheran upbringing, mm-hmm. how did they react to you say, saying, hey, I'm, I want to become Catholic? There was a, there was quite a range of responses. So I would say some were, it's interesting. Uh, so on one side of my family, we, we have sort of a, on one side, on my father's side, there are Catholics and Lutherans back there. And in Wisconsin, a good German settled state, you're either for a long time, you're either Catholic or, or Lutheran. And so they, they kind of had both in the family. And so I remember at one point, my grandma, she's kind of like, well, I mean, what, what, what did you meet a, a Catholic girl or something? Like, I mean, they're basically the same, right? You know, and I'm like, basically the same. I've been this huge journey and it's radically eye opening. What do you mean it's the same? And, uh, you know, she's like, well, you know, we, we both have fish fries and I mean, our churches kind of look similar and it's basically just like, it's, you know, kind of, kind of close to like, there was that, that reaction. Um, there were some that were kind of like, well, you, you seems to be uh, closer to God than we've ever seen you right before you made the most horrible decision of your life. And, uh, you know, definitely, yeah, another side of the family, they go to the, the Wisconsin Lutheran Synod Church, which is like, well, it's interesting. They're, they're kind of like, they're really devout, devoted to like the 16th century tradition. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, but they're they're very much of the, you know, the Pope is the Antichrist. Martin Luther said this, and uh, we, we, we still believe it. So we are pretty scared for you. And uh, yeah, and, and so like with great sincerity in like caring for this, you know, grandson, uh, nephew, you know, that, that they, they'd seen wanting to seek the Lord and then maybe taking a, a wrong turn in their estimation. Yeah. Honestly, just, just praying and trying to like understand. Um, there were also some that it, it, it didn't go so well. So again, I had, I had started to lead a number of Protestant groups and I was kind of in the looking at becoming a pastor or a missionary type track. And so it was like very awkward when suddenly I'm like, you know, I say the one thing that you cannot say, um, <laughs> you know, religiously there, it's like, um, I, I could have said like, hey, I feel like God is calling me to eat only locusts and honey for the next year and dress in sackcloth like John the Baptist. And they've been like, okay, as long as you don't become like a Catholic monk or something. <laughs> you know, it's, like, it's like the one thing you, you can't do. And so like very quickly, I was kind of, uh, yeah. You know, as I was told, yeah, by, by some, it was not pretty at, at the little campus crusade for Christ tribunal. It's like, I was told like, these beliefs are damnable. Like these will send you to hell. And it's like, I, okay, I'm torn because I'm, I'm really seeing this in scripture. I'm also seeing it really in the tradition. It seems like this is there, but like, all right. Um, I, I was also part of the, uh, this interesting little Christian denomination called the Alliance Christian Fellowship, yeah. which, uh, you know, and their thing. I think at least for the time they had most missionaries per capita. So they were like, again, super zealous about wanting to spread the faith. And I love that. Um, but I remember at one point, um, my friend and I who were kind of on this journey together and we we're telling people like, yeah, I think actually the Catholic church might be the real one. Um, you know, first we were told like, well, no Protestant ever becomes Catholic. <laughs> Catholics are evangelized and they become Protestant. No. And like, you know, I, I met a few Protestants that like they grew up Catholic, they never understood anything. And now they're zealous Protestants. And so I was like, okay, but they're like, this has never happened. Um, and then there was like a, a sort of like a sermon preached about how, you know, we are we are saved by uh, the poor pastor. He was nervous. He couldn't get his words straight. But it's like, 
We're saved by, by faith through grace, or by faith. It is not about works. It is not about the Catholic Church. You know, it is just kind of like so obvious because the two of us are like sitting there and it's just awkward. And it's kind of like, okay, he he's concerned about us. He's trying to save his flock, as it were. Um, you know, he's like telling people we're deceived by the devil, which is awkward. And some of those friendships survive. Uh, some don't. And uh, well, I'll, I'll save the names of the innocent, but I will say one one good friend of mine who is actually a, yeah, a, a, a youth group leader and mentor of mine through middle school, um, who actually we remain good friends, and he really he really stayed with me, and we stayed good friends throughout this journey. And he uh, again was non-denominational. He was one of the most like, well, I don't know, like I I've. I've, I've gone to lots of different forms of Christianity and I think we're all trying to follow the Lord. And I, I know some Catholics that really are sincere as well and trying to understand. But um, so this, yeah, this Easter, he and his family will be entering the Catholic church. And it's amazing. Um, and a lot of it had to do with the Eucharist. You know, he, what, what, once you, and I think that's, that's the real key there. Once you understand uh, that Jesus, Jesus is there body, blood, soul, and divinity in the way that he is not anywhere else. Well, where else can I be? I don't want to be anywhere else but with you, Lord. And and that's, you know, as Peter said, Lord, to whom else shall we go? Uh, Eternal life. Amen. Amen. Yeah, absolutely. That and that was yeah, that was my experience. Actually, the Eucharist was the last thing for me. And and I shared that I shared that um uh in in some other episodes, but uh I I, I was on my way to becoming Catholic and, and I'm, and I, I was like, I, I really want, I want this to be true. Like I'm enjoying what I'm learning. I'm enjoying about the church fathers. I'm, I'm coming around on Mary, you know, and, and, <laughs> and, uh, and then, but it was like the Eucharist is the last hurdle for me to get over. Um, and I, I knew it was there and I knew how to get over it. And it's not like one of those things where I can like, be like, um, I don't really believe that because it's kind of a big deal for the, you know, the source and summit of, of our faith. So um, when I understood that, I was like, when it all clicked um, in a, in a Bible study, nonetheless, it all, it all clicked when I started thinking about the Ark of the Covenant. And when that clicked, I was like, I, I can never go back. Like this journey will end in either becoming Orthodox or Catholic. And I, yeah, I, yeah, it was, it was, I hear you hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I, I remember sitting at the Penn state has this huge, uh, non denom or I guess they call it the spiritual center. It's a public school. Um, but I was, I was like sitting around reading John six and just kind of like wrestling, like if this is real, it's everything, but is it really? And like people really believe this. And, um, and then there's a group of, of Catholics with the campus ministry come in and I'm like, just like sitting there, like, like watching them because they're with, uh, they're with a, a monk who is one of their campus chaplains. And I'm like, kind of like watching them. And, uh, you know, and I hear them like, they're talking about like, Oh, we just went to this like Franciscan soup kitchen. And I'm like, Oh, there's like still Franciscan friars, like St. Francis. Okay. So that's still, they're still really doing that. That's, that's kind of a radical thing. Um, you know, and they're like, hey, would you take our picture? I'm like, sure. And I'm like, you know, little, little did they know. It's like, I'm like kind of scoping them out. And I'm like, yeah, they, they, they see him. And I'm like, wow, these people believe they actually like, yeah, they, they receive the body and blood of Christ. And this is what nourishes them. Um, that's amazing. Yeah. So in your journey, you not only decided to become Catholic, you also decided you wanted to become a priest. Talk to me a little bit how that how that went. <laughs> um, that's interesting. I think uh, so. The priesthood and the religious life, in my case, were always intertwined. And that when I talked about this this desire to, yeah, when I was trying to follow the Lord, and I and I couldn't settle the theological questions and what church is the most true or the one founded by Christ, it came down to just well okay, I just want to be a Christian. I just want to truly follow the Lord. And then that came to, well, there are many questions that seem complicated and I can't settle them. There's a lot of things that the Lord calls me to do that I'm not doing. So let's start with those. And uh, it was really a path of personal conversion than just trying to like, in a certain sense, literally trying to live out the gospel, which can be a radical adventure of sorts. Um, 
you, you start taking some things that the Lord says directly as if he's sort of speaking to you and you are well on your path to living religious life, which was a, a kind of like, well, is he really calling me to do this? God has to be calling somebody to do this. Um, and there was something there of, of, of an early call as I was coming into the church. And when I entered at Penn State, we had Benedictine monks who were the campus chaplains and priests who were who really living this life well, beautiful life of prayer and community. And I was like, oh my gosh, so much of like this kind of early church acts community is, is very much present here. This is so beautiful. And the priesthood probably came from my love for the Eucharist. Um, you know, entering religious life doesn't require one to become a priest. Um, and actually, historically, most religious were, were not ordained as priests. Some are. Uh, I am. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the love of the Eucharist was also something where, um, so every religious community, they're founded based on, you can look at them in different ways. So one would be each has a, a certain charism and each often has like a sort of defining work of mercy. So like Mother Teresa's sisters, loving Jesus Christ and the poorest of the poor, boom. The Franciscans imitating the poor Christ, boom. Um, Dominicans, mine, uh, preaching for the salvation of souls. It's a spiritual work of mercy. Um, also, you could look at each, um, we're all called to follow Christ and imitate him in a certain way. But even for all those who embrace the evangelical counsels of poverty, chastity, and obedience, you could say each of the religious orders seems to most closely be imitating and in a certain sense living in their lives an aspect of the life of Christ. So a lot of the monks, for example, like the Desert Fathers or the Benedictines, they're looking at Christ when he withdraws from the crowds and he's just alone with the Father or alone in the desert. And so you're like, oh, yeah, this is okay, this is a path to union with Christ, is to, is to unite to Christ very much in this way. Um, Dominicans, it's like, yes, Christ, you know, preaching and, and doing these sort of things. Others, um, yeah, you're, you're imitating, you know, part of sort of Christ's mission. Again, we all are in a certain way in the body of Christ. Um, but for me, the, the love of the Eucharist was so central that, um, yeah, there was... There was there there was a, there was an attraction there, but it definitely took me a little while. And uh, in the church's wisdom, again, you learn this after two thousand years. They they will say, you know, well, the zealous young man converts uh, to the faith. He's excited about everything. We should probably wait at least two years before we let this guy in the seminary. Um, in my case, it was it was more than that. I ended up uh, working and going back to grad school and working some more, which was actually really good to see. Um, I'm privileged to live. In a great religious community, uh, and this is one part of the Catholic Church. But the church is huge, and I'm glad I got to see, um, you know, traveling for one of my jobs, going to mass at like all these different places in the country. You see, like, oh, this is this is all part of the church. You know, I'm like, I'm at this Hispanic charismatic Catholic mass over here. I'm at this like, oh, this kind of like inner city black gospel kind of like Catholic mass over here, and I'm at this kind of like. This other one, this like Midwest one, which actually feels a little bit more like my my like Lutheran upbringing, you know, this kind of version here, right? I oh, I I, I feel like I kind of know these people. I have some of them over in my family, and uh, you know, it's like I'm glad I got to see a lot of the breadth and even some of the yeah, I'm getting to know the church too. You see, wow, some parts are you're like wow, the Lord's holiness is pouring through, really pronounced in the, in this person here, and other places you see like ooh. Yes, this is this is like the, the sinful, unfaithful uh, new Israel, as it were, that the Lord is like trying to draw back to himself. And, uh, you know, or some parts where you're like, wow, that people kind of sleepy and zombie like over here. The Lord needs to like revive this part of the body a little more. Um, so it was it was a blessing to get to see all of that. But yeah, ultimately, the Lord that kept uh, kept knocking on my heart. And uh, I would say. I got to go to uh, World Youth Day in 2011 in Madrid with Pope Benedict. And uh, it was really over there that I felt the Lord finally saying, after I'd been thinking about it for a while, that was the like, come follow me moment. And uh, even though I didn't know it was the Dominicans yet at that point, in Spain, the land of St. Dominic, it was fitting um, <laughs> that, uh, yeah, ultimately he would be calling me the Dominican order.
You know, that was a, an eye-opening moment for me. I was a pastor, a uh, young pastor at the time. And, and my, I, I have a good friend, his name is uh, uh, Father Ezra Sul- Sullivan. And he uh, sent me a card and said, Justin, I want you to come to my ordination. Um, I am entering the religious life. He was a brother at the time, had been uh, living with the Dominicans and considering it. And, and his card said, I believe that Jesus wants me to be poor, chaste, and obedient. And I was like, dang. <laughs> you know, like, you know, like <laughs> I was like, that is that is a tall order. That is that is a lot. And, and it, I was just, I, I was and then going to his uh, Dominican ordina- ordination at the Dominican house in DC. I was I was just kind of blown away by the the humility and the 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 desire for holiness. You know, it was like you when you're in it, like I mean, you could stand outside and and say like, oh, they're Catholic and blah 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 blah. When you're in it and you're experiencing it and you're seeing these these individuals take these um, these orders and these oaths, um, you you can't help but see that their, their quest to be like Jesus and to walk with them in this way. Wow. So you were you went to to DC. I assume that was at the the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception there, or was it at St. Dominic's Church at that time? It point? was at I think it was at the at the um whatever church is located there at the house, the Dominican House of Studies. Okay, okay. Yep. So if you went to his ordination, then it would have been about a year later when he was in Cincinnati for his first assignment as a young priest that I met a young father, Ezra Sullivan, when I was a novice, just answering, Ah. uh, you know, first year, kind of like boot boot camp, learning to live Dominican life, uh, getting ready to make vows. So it's, that's, uh, that's, that's that's wild. I saw a very, very freshly ordained father, Ezra Sullivan, right there uh, at the beginning of my Dominican life. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and I should say he, he, um, I don't know if I'm using the right word, but it was when he was taking his vows to join the Dominicans. It, it wasn't. It wasn't his ordination oh. to the priesthood. Okay. So this would have been. Yes, you're right. That would have been a solemn vows at the Dominican House of Studies, and it probably would have been uh, a year later. He was a deacon, and another year later he was a priest, and another year later I saw him there. You met him. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> and and yeah. it, what's really cool is that um, we went out to. This is like I don't know 2015 maybe. We went out to Europe. And one of our stops was in Rome. Um, we were on a cruise with my parent for my parents' 50th anniversary. And he, um, I had contacted him. And he's like, I'd love to give you a tour of uh, the Basilica of San Clemente. And so he gave us a tour there and it was so fascinating. And then we went to the little library in the church and he was like, this book is 1500 years old, you know, and this, and, uh, and, and, and my kids um, were geeking out over it, but it was so yeah, such a blessing to, I, it's just one of those things where I, I look back on it now and I realize there were little bread, breadcrumbs along the way to, to becoming Catholic, it, even though I didn't recognize it at the time, it was one of the, it's those things that when you meet the people and the faces of Catholicism and this, the, these sincere Dominican brothers like yourself, and, um, you realize that, uh, it, it, it isn't just a, uh, some sort of caricature of Christianity. Like there are really people who are seeking Jesus and, and striving for holiness. And it's, and that, I think that was really was humbling for me. And I, that's where I, where I said, you know what, it can't all be bad. Like there's, there's some <laughs> truth to it, you know, <laughs> but it's, what a small world. And, and then, you know, and then I, um, and then talking to a friend of mine uh, that I curl with uh, on Monday nights and he goes, Oh yeah, Father John Paul. Yeah, you know, and, ah! like, and it's just, it's just like, and then, and then, um, uh, and then a friend of mine from church who I find that you guys are friends on Facebook, and so it's just, it's just, it's funny. It's like, it's a big tent, but I'm realizing like, maybe it's, it's sometimes a little bit of a small world. Oh, it is. It really <laughs> is. <laughs> uh, well, that's cool. So, um, so then. So you now was it your desire like what came first was it a desire to live the religious life and take these vows and join the dominicans that sort of led you towards being a priest or was it i want to be a priest and this was a pathway towards that hmm. so for me the desire for the religious life came first and i would say that was a uh, both my call to enter and 
my sort of initial call even drawing me into the church. It was like, I just desired to follow the Lord. And this happens apparently to many people with really priesthood and religious life, and probably just a number of people, hopefully just being converted back to following the Lord. You, you read some of these gospel passages of him calling the apostles. And uh, sometimes it just really hits you. And uh, so it was like, that's just what I want. I just want to follow the Lord. And when I recognize what the religious life was, it's like, well, this is just a deepening of, of baptism in a certain sense. Like it's living out the baptismal vows in a certain, in a certain way that isn't for everybody. But as the Lord says, well, you can accept it, accept it. I recommend it. Uh, it's like, well, okay, I'll, uh, I'll take your recommendation there and give it a shot. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Some, you know, in the early days, it's, it's, Sometimes it's still, it's like kind of like walking on water. You're like, well, if you say so, uh, I'm, I'm trusting in you, Lord. Um, but it, it's a beautiful thing. And the love for the Eucharist and the priesthood, I think that came through then when, um, you know, before I really felt that call in Spain, I I'd visited the, the, uh, the Benedictines. And again, to be a priest is not a constitutive part of being a, a monk. Uh, one can be a brother and be praying the divine office and uh, doing a lot of meditating on scripture, work in prayer. And that's a beautiful life. And it, that wasn't, oh, man, I have so many good friends who are Benedictines. It's like, I really wanted that to be where the Lord is calling me, but it ultimately wasn't. Um, the CFR, Franciscan Friars of the Renewal, another awesome community. And they're here in New York City. I went on a vocation weekend with them. They live out the Franciscan charism really well, but it wasn't quite what I felt the Lord was calling me to. And I remember thinking, um, you know, it's like, I, I want to be a part of, it's like, I, I kind of want to follow the Lord in this way. I want community life. I want the prayer, but I want to be like evangelizing. And part of me, I think, yeah, wants to just like preach the truth and help people convert. And, uh, and the thing is, so for Dominicans being a priest, we, we are a clerical order. So we're founding for preaching for the salvation of souls. And if the preaching is effective, if the Lord's grace is working there, well, what's the effect of good preaching conversion of heart. You must be reconciled with the Lord. You want to repent, and then you need the sacrament of confession. Um, or if you're not yet a Christian, the sacrament of baptism. So it's it's very closely sacramentally tied there. Um, and uh, I, I was actually, I was part of a lay missionary group, which I, I hadn't even realized it at the time, that it was very much founded based on the Dominican charism. Uh, this group is called the Missionaries of the Eucharist. And in the summers, we would walk from Maine down to D.C., about a thousand mile walk over 10 weeks. And we would street evangelize. And uh, looking at it now, I'm like, it's so Dominican. And of course, a number of us became priests and religious from this group. And several of us Dominican friars, uh, at least four of us off the top of my head in our province. And uh, a number of you know, Dominican sisters and nuns. But I'm you know, like, OK, we're, we're, we're just walking. We're sharing, sharing the gospel with people. And we're kind of begging for what we need. Well, that seems kind of Franciscan. And we're, we're praying the Liturgy of the Hours, the Divine Office every day. That seems kind of Dominican. And uh, we're all reading books on the faith and kind of discussing them together. Well, I guess that's just kind of a good thing to do in general. And uh, you know, we're trying to be evangelical. And it's like, oh, this is based on the four pillars of Dominican life. Um, but, but after that, come follow me in Spain, I kind of did the tour again and was like, okay, Lord, like I, I really want to follow you, but where's it going to be? And uh, a few of my friends from this lay missionary group were at the Dominican House of Studies. And so I was like, okay, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta come check this out. And I had a vocations weekend and uh, it was wild. I sat down in the choir stalls and we started praying and, uh, and we're chanting the Psalms. And I, I hear this, this chant tone and I'm like, oh, I know this tone. These are the missionaries of the Eucharist tones that we used on our mission trips. And I realized, oh, wait a second. They lifted those from the Dominicans. And, uh, you know, and then as I, as I kind of on that weekend, you know, got explained to me the, the life of St. Dominic, you know, this, uh, this priest who was traveling with his, his bishop, he was a canon, so attached to a cathedral at the time. And uh, he, he had only heard about these heretics, the Albigensians, who had fallen away from the true faith. And he spends the night there with his bishop, and he gets in a conversation with the innkeeper, who turns out to be one of these heretics, an Albigensian. And he stays up all night basically trying to, you know, argue with this man and, you know, explain the truth and bring him back. And finally, finally, you know, by daybreak, the man is ready to, to come back. And so St. Dominic realizes like, oh my gosh, this is spreading throughout Europe. We need an army of people, an army of preachers to come 
and to bring these people back to the fullness of truth. And uh, when I heard that, I was like, man, I just, you know, I'm sure many of us have spent like the, the way too late night conversation with college friends, you know, trying to like, you know, evangelize them at times. But I was like, oh gosh, yeah, I, I have definitely done that at a bar. And that's basically what St. Dominic was doing, um, you know, attempting to do this, except he was successful probably more, way more than I was. Um, you know, and there was something there just that, that desire, that burning zeal for the salvation of souls, you know, Lord, how can any soul perish, um, you know, for, for not hearing the truth about you and his desire to just go out and rescue them. That was so attractive to me. And then the parts of the life, shoot, Dominican life, well, it's very full. We have, uh, we have the full chanted uh, office and choir. We chant, you know, the Psalms at least five times a day together, like the Benedictine monks do. Um, but on top of that, we also have a religious discipline of study. So even back in the Middle Ages, it's like every every Dominican house had somebody with a doctorate that was constantly instructing the brothers in more and more studies so that they could preach better and share the truth with people. Um, living all things in community, the fraternal life that I desired. And then on top of that, and all of this is ordered to basically fill fill us up so that we overflow and share the fruits of all of our study and contemplation and our preaching for the salvation of souls. And I was like, I think that's the one for me. I think I was actually made for that. And uh, yeah, praise, praise the Lord. You know, he, he, (laughs) he has good things in store for us that we never dreamed of. I I never knew what, what a Dominican friar was growing up. I never could have told you like, yeah, I want to be that when I grew up. I didn't know it existed, but, but the Lord knew. Sounds like there were lots of breadcrumbs along the way as well. (laughs) <laughs> uh, that that then you, you you know it came full circle and you're like ah I see it now right <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're like I, w- I wonder who else saw this coming but it just wasn't me until I arrived <laughs> yeah absolutely um so so when you decided to join uh, the Order of the Dominicans and devote your life to religious life it, uh, eventually enter the priesthood as well. Uh, what were some of the reactions like, particularly from your family members? Hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, it's interesting. So the family had come a little ways from my my first conversion, which really scared the heck out of them. And, uh, you know, but then it was like, yeah, I remember my mom and, you know, I remember like she she met our, our campus priest um, and some of my friends and we're like, these people really love Jesus. This doesn't seem to be like the Antichrist. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, she's still like a little like concerned, um, but then seeing me through the years. And, uh, I think there've been times when I was going on vocation weekends at different orders and trying to sort it out at the same time, you know, uh, I, I, I think maybe for a while in my mom's heart, every time that I would like be dating a Catholic girl, she's like, well, at least, at least lots of grandchildren, big Catholic family. Okay. You know, it's, it's, that's not so bad. I can deal with that. Um, then when it came time to finally enter, it was sort of like, I think some of the family was like, well, you've been thinking about this for long enough. You just need to get it out of your system. You just got to like try it and realize that's not going to be the thing. Um, You know, there were some too that it's kind of like, oh, come on, you're going to like give up your career and like all these, you know, other, other things going on. Um, But I think those who knew me most knew that like, yeah, I, I think they realized like I, I had to go for it if I felt the Lord was calling me to, otherwise I would always regret it. And uh, so even if they didn't understand it, um, <laughs> yeah, they, 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 they understood I had to at least give it a shot. And it, it, it seemed to have, uh, have took, and it also over the years, I think, you know, going to the house of studies, like you mentioned, the Dominican house of studies and seeing all the brothers there, I think that was actually powerful for a number of them. Uh, definitely for my mom. My mom actually, uh, you know, she was kind of trying to figure out, and this is a real thing for families too, um, especially if they're not Catholic. And even if they are Catholic, it's an adjustment. My son is now, okay, he's not doing the normal thing of like having a family or or being perpetually single that sometimes happens these days. Like, you know, we're hanging out waiting for something to happen, but um, he's doing this other thing. And like, how do I, how do I tell people about it? And how do I fit in his life? And, and especially for you know, family that's not Catholic in a certain sense. I remember my mom, she had some good analogies of like, hmm, okay, like your father was in the Navy and they would just send him all over and didn't really ask me about that. Well, that's kind of what's happening to you now. Like the church is just going to send you on mission and uh, and I will be informed of where my son will be. 
Uh, but I understand you're like on this mission. So it's okay that you're not coming home as frequently because you're doing a good thing for the Lord. And so she could relate to that. And a little bit, um, you know, being in athletics, you know, she was like, oh, I was always one of kind of like the, the, the team moms. You know, I knew the other moms, our sons did sports together. And now there are all these Dominican friars. And so I knew the other moms. And now I'm kind of like one of the, the Dominican moms, I guess. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was beautiful. And actually definitely, uh, yeah, some of her, her good uh, friendships, relationships with the families of the other Dominicans uh, helped her along the way. And she actually, uh, she, she entered the Catholic church um, when I was a deacon, um, which that talk about breadcrumbs along the way. So her current parish, which we'll, uh, we'll give a good shout out here to St. Andrew by the Bay in Arnold, Maryland, woo, um, right up, right off 50. Uh, yeah, I, know that, I know that location very well. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, for me, it was wild because the first time I'd ever gone to Catholic mass was to that church for my best friend in second grade, um, his first communion. And I remember going there and being like, hmm, the church seems decently like a Lutheran church. Liturgy seems decently like a Lutheran liturgy. What was not the same, though, was instead of going down to the basement to have pasta salad afterwards, I went out with his family to a pub and so the adults are having a great time, good, good Irish Catholics of Maryland, and the kids are having huge ice cream sundaes. And I remember thinking, like, I'm almost feeling guilty because we're having, like, a little too much fun. It wasn't just, like, a serious church event, but, like, that, that was, like, okay, this is a part of Catholic life. Sometimes, you know, we, uh, we got a little Mardi Gras going on, too. Um, <laughs> so that, that was, like, a very early thing. And, uh, yeah, and actually I, I'd known um, – yeah, some people in high school too and, and like had gone a couple times and like little did I know that that Catholic church that I was like you know right in the neighborhood someday wow okay like my my mom would be entering the church there and becoming Catholic and then I would be coming back as a newly ordained priest to celebrate a mass of Thanksgiving there um yeah, years later never could have seen it wow that's amazing do you have did you um yeah, tell me a little bit about your mom's uh, journey there. Like, did you have a part in it? Well, talk to me about that. <laughs> Definitely had a part, you know, first first scaring her when I became Catholic. So I remember, God bless her, um, you know, it's funny, when, when, when I was kind of like, I think this is crazy. I, the Lord couldn't be calling me to ministry, could he? Like, I feel like maybe he is. I'm expecting more opposition, but my friends are like, yep, this is good. My mom was like, okay, yeah, I could see that. And this is when I was Protestant. And it was like, I, I don't know if I quite see it, but okay, I'm willing to be, be open here. And then, uh, so going on this journey, that was well and fine enough. But I remember calling my mom and saying, you know, I, uh, been doing a lot of reading and praying and trying to follow the Lord. And I, I think I need to go talk to a Catholic priest. Um, and, and she just broke down crying and was like, you know, please just, just, wait another week, just pray. And I'm like, thinking, I'm like, well, this is what led me here. Um, but it was like, okay, mom, I love you. You gave me life. I can give you another week of praying about this. Like I, I it's the Lord that I'm trusting here. So, you know, it's not my idea. Trust me. Um, and, uh, you know, but then, yep, we, we eventually met with the priest. So along there, I, I think, um, for her, so definitely when I was going through RCIA and we were discussing things, there were things that I was learning and sharing. And that actually, it's interesting. I think that that brought her back to the Lutheran church at the time, looking back at it now. Because I remember she was like, okay, well, no, Catholic, I don't know about that. But uh, but as I'm talking to her, I'm like, but like the Eucharist and like in baptism and, and the church fathers, there's just like God's grace poured out in these amazing ways he gave us. She's like, well, yeah, I believe that too. And I'm like, you know, well, you know, you're, you're, you're going to this, this Presbyterian church that definitely doesn't believe that. And, uh, and, and, and like, if you told them that you believe that they would say, no, that is horrible. You're not actually, you don't actually trust in God's grace. You're doing these little like mechanical ritual things and think it's going to like parasitically save you or something. And uh, you know, like they, they, if you say that they're going to basically say, well, you're Catholic. You're, you're like believing in some Catholic stuff, even if you, you know, you say you're Lutheran, um, but she, but she was, uh, she was definitely sincerely seeking too at the same time, probably asking the Lord to s save me from disaster. And he, he has saved me from disaster in many ways. Um, 
you know, but yeah, it's interesting. She kind of came to appreciate the sacraments in a certain way. Um, also, this is wild. So I remember she was going to the Naval Academy chapel. And uh, and so like people knew that her son was studying to become a priest, uh, even though she was not Catholic. And so like these Catholics, I think, would kind of like, <laughs> they, like started to swarm her in various ways like with great love, but we're kind of like, you know, we're so excited about your sound. She's like, I guess I can be excited too. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and yeah. And I want to say, yeah, uh, a number of people also, I would say, um, well, you, you went through the experience of actually being a Protestant minister and coming into the church. Yeah. So there were, there were a number of people that confided in my mother before she was Catholic, that they were Protestant ministers and they had heard that her son was studying to be a priest and they actually really wanted to enter the church too, but mm. like, weren't quite sure what was going to be happening career wise and providing for the family wise. They're kind of like trying to figure it out, but you know, and so she's like seeing this is like, Oh man, what's, what's, what, what's going on. Um, and, and definitely. Yeah. She, she's very loving. And so she loved the, she loved visiting the Dominican brothers and having like, you know, her, her 50 sons that she sort of came to visit um, in a certain way. And the other Dominican mothers definitely were very good. She was part of like women's uh, book study and Bible study um, with the Catholics. And, uh, you know, she, she ended up then being like, okay, I got to check out RCIA. And she actually went through it. It wasn't quite ready to enter the first time. And it's funny because she didn't, she didn't tell me she was doing that, um, <laughs> which is funny. So like she, she went through, RCIA the whole way and got to the end it was just kind of like, I'm just not quite there yet and I want to be totally sincere and so then later after the fact she told me and kind of was like apologizing a little bit it was like I mean I went through but like I just wasn't ready sorry I'm like don't apologize to me like this is you following the Lord like when you're ready you'll be ready and uh but there came a point where yeah and she was actually yeah going to mass sometimes with you know other Dominican moms and things and she just you know I got a call in the summer that was, you know, I, yeah, I went to mass and I just, I don't know. I just broke down crying. I just really, really wanted the Eucharist and uh, I think it's time. And it was like, yep. Sounds like it's time to me. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And praise the Lord. I was able to go. Uh, yeah. Go to the mass there where she entered the church with a number of my Dominican brothers. We went out to St. Andrew by the Bay and uh, yeah, that was, that was a beautiful moment. I, um, it was surprising to me. It's funny. I like many Protestants and you probably had this too. Com coming to understand who Mary is uh, for us and for the church and how like she is such a gift that Christ shares with us. Um, you know, it's funny. I, I, I struggled with a while, but my mom is such a good mom that I like, I almost couldn't understand how she struggled with that. Cause I'm like, Oh my gosh, this, this is like, I'm like, and I, but I knew what, once, once she got it, she would get it, you know, I was like, once it, once it, once it clicks for her and then it, it, it definitely did um, very beautifully. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's always a big hurdle because we, you know, as a Protestant, we're undermining the role of Mary and who she is. And, and as a Catholic, we really, you really lean into it. And, um, and I think for me, I don't know about for you, but for me, I was shocked at how much of it is derived from scripture, uh, both the old Testament and the new Testament and seeing, and I, and I was like, Whoa, you know, like someone made a comment the other day, I shared something online about, um, <laughs> about the Holy family and, and, uh, and the role of Joseph and, 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 uh, and, you know, Mary being a consecrated virgin and, and kind of like the Eastern, the Eastern church view of it. And uh, uh, a, a relative of mine said, time to get in the word, Justin. And I would like, this is all in scripture. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, this is all yeah. very scriptural. If you, if you take some time to consider it and uh, yeah, it was, it's, it's, it's such a beautiful thing. The, the, the role of uh, the blessed Virgin Mary and, and the way that she still leads people to Jesus today, you know? Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, us Dominicans, we are huge fans of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Uh, she's given us a lot of things. One little thing that uh, has become widespread for us would be the rosary. And uh, and the thing there, it's interesting when I, when I talk to people um, who are not as familiar with the rosary, they immediately think this is 
This is a Marian prayer, which it is. Um, we pray the Hail Mary, uh, the words of the angel to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Um, but at its center, it's it's Jesus. It's like we're praying with Mary, and she's just leading us uh, to get to know her son more. It's like all these mysteries of his life. It's like mom's just bringing out the scrapbook, and I'm like, this is definitely true for me. It's like, um, you know, yeah, if mom breaks open the scrapbook and she's known you entire life and she's showing you who her son is and, uh, you know, it's like, uh, yes, and at this moment of his life, I was there. Um, you believe that the cross of Christ is important? I was there. I was there at the foot of Christ and that was my son. And like, I want you to, yeah, that was amazing. And I want you to like really enter into just how amazing that was. And she wants to help you. You're like, oh yeah, um, this, this, this is amazing. So as Dominicans, we love the rosary and we actually have a, an awesome uh, event coming up this September 30th. So October is the month of the rosary and to kick it off um, on Saturday, uh, September 30th, the Vigil of Rosary Sunday at the National Basilica of the Immaculate Conception, Washington, D.C. We're going to be having a full day event with the Dominican Friars, the Dominican Rosary Pilgrimage, and uh, we'll be kicking off the month of the rosary together. It's going to be awesome. Awesome. And now, and and what what does that pilgrimage consist of? So the pilgrimage, it consists, the first part is, I would say the, the spiritual component before the feet are even moving is this nine month novena. So we have uh, our sweet Dominican Rosary pilgrimage novena cards. Um, and so we're praying a prayer, basically, as we're praying the rosary, that the Lord is starting to um, work and transform us. We actually the prayer talks about uh, just as the apostles were with the Blessed Virgin Mary at Pentecost. It's another thing I never really thought about as a Protestant. You know, certain aspects, you're like, wait, the apostles together with the Blessed Virgin Mary, you know, go to this upper room and they're praying together. You're like, wait a second. Oh, we're like, all, like you know, Pentecostals aren't like, oh, yeah, we, we're all about the Holy Spirit, man. So we draw close to the Virgin Mary because that's when, you know, the Holy Spirit came down. It's like as Catholics now we get that. Um, and so we're, we're also that like, yes, blessed Virgin Mary, you know, pray for us. And as we're with you drawing close to the Lord, pour forth that Holy spirit on us, like you did on your apostles and prepare us And this nine month novena, which started in January and people can join at any time. Um, in a certain sense, Mary had her initial yes. And the word became flesh in her womb and nine months. She pondered the words of the angel Gabriel in her heart. And Christ grew there. And so in a certain sense, the nine month uh, novena is a time of us, the spirit, the mystical body of Christ, the church, all praying together this prayer so that Christ may become, you know, more and more present in our lives. And then like after the nine months, Christ was born at Christmas. Uh, so after nine months, the mystical body of the church is going to be gathering together. People are going to be coming from all across the country to this national basilica that's in Our Lady's honor, the Basilica of the Immaculate Conception. In a certain way, then we will be gathered together with Mary to be drawn close to Christ in the Eucharist. Hmm. That's so beautiful. That's so awesome. Very yeah, cool. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> It'll be quite a year to have the, the National Eucharistic Revival in July, and then you have um, the, the, pilgrimage, the Rosary Pilgrimage in, um, in uh, September. It would be awesome. Yeah, and actually this this first one will be, so this September will be the Dominican Rosary Pilgrimage, and then the following uh, July will be, I believe, the, the Eucharistic Congress. Mm -hmm. There'll be a summer of 2024, Okay, if I'm, if I'm thinking right. And, and, you know, it's interesting, as people have asked, you know, well, how do these things fit together? It's like, well, yes, it's, it's to Jesus through Mary. And so I love the Eucharist. The Eucharist is, it is Christ himself. It is the source and summit of our lives. And yet the church and her wisdom also knows, well, you know, because if we did not have the wisdom of tradition here, we could, we could think for a moment, well, wait, if this is the source and summit of Christian life, well, why am I doing anything else? Why am I listening to scripture and not just like consuming more Eucharist? Why am I, why do we need these devotions like the rosary? Doesn't it only distract from this? I'm only, you know, I should only be focused on this. But just as at mass, we come in and first we hear the word of God proclaimed to us. We, we have to have our, our faith strengthened and kindled in order to appreciate who it is we're about to receive. And basically the rosary in a sense, a condensation of 
the whole of scripture, the whole of the mystery of Christ, the whole of the gospel. And so very much like this Marian pilgrimage is something that's like, yeah, we're asking, we're, we're not just journey, journeying towards Christ in the Eucharist. We're doing it in the best possible way. We are, we are with Christ's mother being prepared to receive him more in the Eucharist. And so there's a certain preparation that has to happen in the preaching of the word. And definitely, I think, Marian devotion that really helps us be disposed to really receive and appreciate all that Christ wants to give us in the Eucharist. Mm. Yeah, uh, that's, yeah, that's super profound. Um, I was, I was finally, you know, like, um, as an evangelical pastor, you're just kind of figuring things out as you go along, you know, and, and, and I think what I really appreciate about the Catholic church is like, they've had many, many years to think through these things and, <laughs> <laughs> and there's nuance and nuance and nuance. Well, speaking of nuance, um, I want to get back a little bit to the the priesthood and um, and talk. Tell me a little bit about, you know, why would someone, uh, you know, because I think most people's experience with a priest is at a parish, right? And and generally they they are diocesan priests. Um, uh, Tell me a little bit why someone might choose an order versus being a diocesan priest and maybe some you spoke a little bit of, of some of the differences but maybe some of the um the big differentials sure so i guess the priesthood in itself and uh, diocesan priests would be the case here they're one of the three levels of holy orders christ instituted um bishops priests and deacons shout out saint paul way to go um so uh, priests, they are normally part of a diocese, which means they're, they're geographically based. So like the entire world is divided up into territories that have a bishop that are governing that. Um, and this is from, from the early church. You have the bishop there. And assisting him, he has a number of priests. And so the diocesan priest would be tied geographically to serving within that diocese and assisting that local church. And so that's one of the first primary characteristics of a diocesan priest is that he is local, territorial there, and part of that local church. Um, and also, while he uh, certainly, I would say, um, I think probably notable for people today would say, oh, well, um, a diocesan priest is uh, celibate as well. So yes, he is. He's also um, chosen celibacy for the kingdom of heaven. Um, he he would live simply usually and uh, you see a diocesan priestly salary and you're like, wow, the hours of priests, like the hours that a priest works is insane. The amount of schooling he has to have is insane. And this guy with like, you know, it's like he went through MD level schooling and he probably makes like minimum wage by the time you divide up all the hours that he works. But uh, <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, but he's probably got like some nice old ladies cooking for him and stuff. So, you know, like he's, he's surviving and all, but, but it's a very simple life. Um, and obedience he is... Oh, I was going to say, I was, uh, I was I, that was one thing um, where I, I went up to our, our pastor after uh, the Easter Holy Week, you know, and, and I'd seen the whole schedule of Holy Week. And I said, you know, Father, I never understood why priests had to be celibate or never, never understood that kind of co- concept of, of priestly celibacy until I saw all that you do. And I'm like, I was like, I would complain if I had to, if I had to preach multiple times a day, <laughs> like, in, you know, and you're just leaving mass multiple times a day and everything else that's going on in the life of the church. So yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> no, no. I mean, there is a, there is a practical thing. I said, that's maybe one of the, the three, in a sense, the least, but sometimes the thing that people notice the first, you know, I talked to Protestant pastor friends are like, I'm getting my Sunday homily ready. And it's like, I have a homily every day uh, that I'm preparing and the Sunday homily and, uh, and confessions most days. And, uh, you know, and again, I would say probably all ministers are probably doing a good amount of like marriage preps and and visiting the dying and and that kind of thing and, and other stuff. But um, yeah, the amount of like preaching and sacramental ministry is definitely very heavy. And I would say the other two things, um, yeah, we're again, for all, you know, priests being celibate, this is very uh, fitting. So one, some some translations will use, you know, um, eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven. And so again, going back to kind of the time of Christ where we don't have a lot of eunuchs running around today. So you're like, okay, so what, what, what's, he, what's he talking about in context here? And, uh, and you're looking at, you know, the eunuchs were, okay, 
they were often entrusted by the king with like their most important stuff because basically they knew like this person is not starting his own family. Like he's not starting this other thing that could become a rival thing. It's actually like, well, no, he's, he's fully invested in the king's kingdom. He doesn't have this other thing that's going on over here. And so there's a certain thing in which, you know, just as the, uh, the Old Testament Levites, they didn't have any property of their own. Their property was the Lord. In a very real sense, it's like, yeah, I, I'm not building my own, uh, my own lineage, um, my, my own kingdom, my sons that I am raising up. It's like, nope, all I have is part of the kingdom of heaven. It's like I'm, I'm baptizing and preaching to and building up uh, sons and daughters for the Lord, part of his kingdom. But this is, uh, you know, we're, we're fully on board. Mm-hmm. And the, uh, the sacrifice aspect as well, I would say, in the words of consecration, so when the priest is speaking these words, these words of Christ, which are his words in a sense too, this is my body, there's something very fitting that, that he has sacrificed bodily, the, the goods that naturally would be there, you know, with marriage and family life. He's, he's given up himself entirely as, as the Holocaust offering to place himself on the altar in a certain sense too he's he's given up other things so that you know there's a sacrifice in his body that he's also conforming to christ when he's speaking these words um and so this is something yeah essential for the priesthood but i think the uh the vows of you know poverty chastity and obedience that a religious take so again also um celibacy obedience um it's a little more hands-on. You could say the obedience is a little bit more hands-on. When you live in a religious community and you have like your local superior there, it's a little bit different than like, oh, I'm the local priest and the bishop. He's in the diocese, and so he may assign me somewhere and I'll go there. But when you're actually part of a, a community life and you vowed that I'll be obedient to God through an authority that he established, it's it's very proximate. Uh, it becomes real in a concrete way on a daily basis. Um, and the community life is definitely... A distinctive characteristic of, of religious. So having having all things in common. Um, and most of us, I would say there are religious communities that exist just within a diocese or just in a region, but most of us are worldwide. So that's another thing where, you know, the Dominican order were founded for a specific charism, preaching for the salvation of souls, and I could be assigned anywhere in the world. Um, As our friend Father Ezra is in, in Rome. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he is. I need to get out there and visit him soon. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, and do you, do you, uh, is there a, is there a specific bishop that is, I know you guys have your, um, like the superior, but is there a bishop that is overseeing the different orders? Hmm. This is a great question. So, um, the hierarchy that Christ established where the bishops are over a regional church. So in, in a sense, anyone who does ministry there, whether this person is uh, a lay person participating in a ministry, that's a recognized ministry of the church, or a priest or a religious, for any public ministry that's being done in the name of the church, that's under the authority of the bishop. So for instance, I'm here in New York City, uh, Cardinal Timothy Dolan, who's, who's a blast, uh, quite a personality, um, he, I, I get a letter from him called a faculties letter that says, um, you, you have permission to, uh, publicly celebrate mass and to preach into these kinds of ministries here in this diocese. And also the bishops have the authority of the keys for the forgiveness of sins, which Christ gave to Peter. Um, so you have authority, yep, to be absolving sins in the sacrament of confession here as well. And so wherever even though I'm part of a religious community, not just part of this diocese, any priest who is here has to receive from that bishop uh, the faculties to do um, ministry in the name and the authority of, of Christ and his church. Um, the difference there would be, so Cardinal Dolan doesn't assign me here quite in the same way, though. Uh, I was out in Kentucky last year, a little different than New York City. Um <laughs> And, uh, you know, my, my religious superior said, okay, we're the East Coast province. I could have been assigned anywhere in the East Coast or, or overseas. Um, you know, he said, okay, I would like you to come from Louisville, Kentucky to New York City. And so, all right, 
I'm moving to New York City. He brought me here and he can determine, here's what I want you to do kind of within the order, these certain roles. And any of our internal life, our religious superior is the one who governs that. But then as soon as it is a, and I want you to work at this church and say, be the pastor of this church. Well, then at that point, he's saying, he can tell me to come to town and show up and that he wants me to be there. But ultimately, then he has to ask the local bishop and say, here's the guy that I propose would be our next pastor at this church, which you've asked us to run here in your diocese. And he could say, yep. Or he could say no. Or he might say, like, actually, I want you guys to entirely leave that church and run this different church instead. And, and the bishop has, you know, again, that sort of governance within his, his territory. He has, he's a successor of the apostles. He has real, real authority in this area. So the religious orders work with the bishop very closely. Um, mm -hmm. But as far as, again, yeah, our superior could say, sometimes they'll do this, like, <laughs> the bishop might be like, oh, I really like this pastor doing this thing over here. It's a really important thing for my diocese. And the religious superior is looking over, like, half of the, you know, country and is like, well, actually, we, we have this other need over here, or we have to do something else. So we'll kind of be like, okay, I need, I need this guy to go. And some of the bishop will be like, oh, I'd really like him to stay a little bit more. And then the religious superior like, well, I'll give you another good guy. Um, but yeah, as far as, yeah, that's kind of the delineation, if that makes sense. Yeah, th that does make sense. Walk me through um, an average day for you. Ooh, average day for me. Um, for an average week. <laughs> let's, let's start with a day. Um, okay, so priests, uh, we generally need to wake up early. Um, things get really, really busy, and prayer is very important. I would say another defining um, aspect for religious, um, canon law is not the most fun book to read, but sometimes it says important things very succinctly. And so it has this line where it says, um, you know, contemplation is the first duty of all religious, mm. which is great because you're like, oh, my charism is preaching with the salvation of souls. I got to study a lot and get out there and do things. Or Mother Teresa's sisters might be like, ah, there's a poor man dying on the streets. I got to take care of him. Boom, boom, boom. Um, but it just emphasizes that again, like the prayer has to come first. It's first and foremost, that union with God in prayer that then allows you to do any of these ministries. And so, yep, priest, we wake up very early in the morning. And that is usually, um, if you're going to have, uh, I would say personal prayer in addition to, um, so as a, as, a, as a religious, we have five offices that we pray during the day. I guess like five prayer times praying the Psalms. Each of those is about 15 minutes. Um, Dominicans pray the rosary as well. Um, as a priest, I'm celebrating mass as well. And uh, we're recommended to do at least 30 hours of prayer, which is encouraged to be done in front of the blessed sacrament. I tend to like an hour for myself. I have needs, you know, some people have extra coffee needs. I have extra prayer needs. Um, so it's like, okay, we're going to wake up a little earlier and uh, we're going to, we're going to need that hour with the Lord uh, near him in the Eucharist and soak that in. Um, also, I would say if there's any, uh, yeah, again, yep. You want, you want to last for a while as a priest and you definitely want to stay healthy. And so exercise and sleep can also really get pushed away, but that's another thing where like the early morning battle is kind of like, okay, am I going to get the extra prayer time I need? Am I going to maybe get some workout and other stuff? Um, but it's got to start early. And then in my case, living in a community, we have a community set time for prayer. So around, you know, seven in the morning, that's when either if somebody is on to celebrate mass at the church, they might have that first mass um, or otherwise in community, you'd be going down and you'd be praying your first prayers. And beautifully, the divine office, the first one always starts, oh, Lord, open my lips and my mouth will proclaim your praise. Um, so, you know, we're asking the Lord from the beginning, open, open my lips, the first words of the day that they will praise you. And so we're praying the Psalms together. And uh, so, yeah, usually in the beginning of the day, we've got, got after the personal hour of prayer, then there's the <laughs> half hour or so of chanting the Psalms together as a community and celebrating mass. Um, and then after that, we're usually ready for breakfast, but real life as a priest, it's like, well, you, you might think you're heading right to breakfast, but you know, right after mass, somebody in need has seen you. And, and it's like, yep, um, here, here's a crisis we need to talk about, or I 
I'm, I'm really sick. Can you anoint me? Or I need, can you give me communion to bring to this other person who's sick? So, oh, right there. And that's why is we got to pray early because right, you know, you think you're like, oh, I'm only an hour into the day. And already, <laughs> you know, the Lord, the Lord could just decide to blow up your planned schedule with like wonderful opportunities to love his people that he brings to you. Um, and then you're there and in the morning, um, I'll say this varies. So when I was a, a campus chaplain, it was interesting. College students, they tend to stay up late and get up late. So first thing that I would also try to bust out is like any kind of administrative work. It's like pound through as many emails as I can. If there's any planning, if we're going to do some homily prep, we got to get that done because as soon as I set foot on campus, it's like I'm devoured by by young young people who want grace, which is a beautiful thing. It's like, yep, this is what I signed up for. Um, but, you know, they're like, dad, feed me, give me truth, give me grace, give me sacraments. And you're like, yes, this is so awesome and exhausting. And I love you. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, quickly, quickly get consumed there. And then, uh, yeah, you know, if you didn't celebrate the morning mass, then you might have a midday mass in the middle of the day. Or if you're, God bless some of these diocesan priests that have like multiple parishes or something, they might be saying their second mass that day and preaching again. Um and then being human, most of us are going to be eating, but probably it's going to be a kind of a quick, crazy eating thing that we all try to eat healthier and have found various ways, like uh, got to give a shout out to Greek yogurt. It's like a miracle substance, um, you know, but it's like, OK, or like a, I don't know, power bar or something. It's like, yeah, you're usually moving pretty quick. And then you're also like, I can't eat a real lunch because if I do, I'm going to go into a food coma and I won't be ready for <laughs> what's coming right after lunch. Um, so. Yeah, then it's coming. And then there, there's always there's always tons of appointments you got to fit in, I would say, because these are all important things. Going to, um, whew, yeah, you know, pe people that it's like, I'm having either a crisis in my life or I just need advice. It's like, I'm, I'm trying to figure out if the Lord calling me this thing, I might be called to a vocation or father, we want to get married. Okay, the church and her wisdom has a great, marriage prep program where we're going to like first make sure you know there's no no secret marriages anybody else is not telling you about all these old customs of like publishing the bands which we normally can just check in other ways but uh it's like you know we're, we're looking out for you too and we got to make sure that both of you understand what marriage is before you get into this and uh yeah and then other random things will emerge too because sometimes you're like maintenance guy for the church is on vacation and the church is now flooding so okay yep i gotta go you know call this thing in and uh try to try to save the valuables from getting destroyed um yeah that, that happens throughout the day but i would say um <clears throat> both for campus ministry and for parish priests evenings are also very 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 busy it's definitely not a um if, if anything if you have a breather it might be more in the midday Cause you're like, you know, some of that definitely has to be like all kinds of prep and administrative work happening, but not everybody's available in the middle of the day to come in for stuff for like meetings or group meetings or stuff. But suddenly in the evening, it's like, Oh, now that the work day is done or now that like classes are done, that's when everything is being done. So you're like, you know, one night now, now, now we'll get a little bit more into the week schedule here. You know, it's like, okay, what has to happen in the church? You're like, well, we got to have something for the people becoming Catholic. So we got RCIA one night. And it's like, we got to have uh, adult faith formation. We're building up the faith of others with some like catechesis in various forms another night. And then maybe there's something for the, uh, the young people as well. We'll have some some Eucharistic adoration with, with music and, you know, pizza and beer afterwards and socialize. Hopefully you guys find a good, a good spouse or something. And, uh, you know, you guys are probably keeping me up a little bit too late. I got to get up really, really early to pray the next morning. Um, and then you get closer to the weekend and it's kind of like, okay, well, we know Saturday is going to be packed with weddings. Sometimes it's several weddings in a day and baptisms. So Saturdays are fun. Uh, so you're like, yeah, this is a lot happening, but funerals also, funerals also get packed in a Saturday. Um, and then Sunday comes and, you know, a lot of times there's, there's multiple masses going on, with multiple confessions happening. And uh, so it is a, yeah, for our longevity, we try to take a day off, uh, yeah. sure. and you know, but it's like some, it's it's a little bit of a an adventure there sometimes in the week because sometimes like I I intended to take the day off, 
but at least I got half a day off um, somewhere in the middle there. But it's it's a full life, but it's a really, really beautiful and blessed life. Um, yeah. What is there? Is there something you particularly love to do on your day off? Hmm. I love to uh, go hiking outside on my day off if I can, in part because so um, I, I I did gymnastics for most of my life growing up through college, and uh, let's just say, yep, there's there's not not hours for working out like there used to be. Um, <laughs> this is probably true for all of us in our vocations, you know, whether we're you know father of a, a family or a priest or religious, but um, anyway, it's like. Yeah, the, the luxury of like, you know, I'm going outside to be with God in his creation for several hours and I'm getting exercise and also like, um, so I, I'd love to read and learn. This is probably most priests and Dominicans, but, um, you know, it's like at some point the, the eyeballs of just like either looking at a screen or a book or reading or something, you're like, there's, there's, a, there's a beauty to pursuing the truth in that way, but there's also something about like, oh, I'm, I'm out in nature and the beauty here and I'm moving and, uh, and this is just like, yeah, that, that, that's for me a personal thing. I'm like, okay, I got to have that for, for the balance going on. And, uh, yeah, in New York city though, I have to say I, it's, it's a battle. I'm, I'm not far from central park. So that's about the closest thing I get, but I need to find some better hiking spots within an hour that I can, I can escape to on my day off. Yeah, for sure. Not a lot of nature. It's all kind of packed in there on Manhattan, right? <laughs> yeah, as one, as one of our old priests says, yes, there's a lot of humanity in New York City. <laughs> yes, there is. Yes, there is. <laughs> yes. And the Lord is here for us and we need it. <laughs> um, is there is there a particular thing that part, part of the priesthood, like a, a sacrament that you love doing maybe more than the others? Hmm. I'd say top top two mass and confessions. And, Talk to me. And, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Keep going. Well, um, mass mass. I, I I was so looking forward to, and and I you know it's like yeah, this is going to be this is amazing. It's mind blowing, and and it and it it was and it is and more. And so yeah, words words do not do not do that justice. But in a sense, I was expecting that um, the Eucharist is the sacrament of sacraments. Uh, but confession, I would say both in becoming, and this is similar too, in becoming Catholic even, you know, that was, that was like what really drew me in. And then there was confession, which I both recognized that I needed. And as a priest, I recognize everyone needs. Um, but it was sort of a, a surprise at how much I came to love that sacrament in a sense, and that... Um, yeah, God's mercy becomes very concrete when you're when you're able to kneel before him and say, you know, Lord, um, not just in general, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm a sinner like everyone else. And I trust that you forgive me kind of in general, but in a very concrete way, very personal way. Um, Lord, I am a sinner. You know that better than I do. And I and I failed in these ways. And, and, and awkwardly, I, I have asked for your forgiveness repeated times for some of these. These are quite familiar. Um but I, I trust in your great mercy uh, and I ask you to heal me of these things and to forgive me and to give me the strength to follow you, uh, to, to repent, give me the grace to do that. Um, that, that was something that, ooh, as far as like really growing in my knowledge of how much God loves me and his mercy, confession was huge. And so then as a priest, to be able to, to be the instrument through which God dispenses that mercy to others, that was something that, um, yeah, that was a little bit of the, the surprise. I was really looking forward to the Eucharist and it is amazing and I love it. But confession was kind of more of the, the hidden gift that was more than I expected it to be. And I love it more than I than I realized. It is just, it is, it is such a gift. It's like, you know, as we were saying, New York City, there's lots of humanity. Um, there is everywhere, but but here you see it in a certain sense, or it's invisible in a certain sense. And so you see, like there's all this stuff you read about in the papers and you're like, what does that do to people's souls? I can't even imagine you know, all these people walking around with burdens and to be like, to be asked by the Lord to be available so that when he works in their hearts, they want to, to be freed from these burdens and forgiven and do these things to be the one who's, who's 
who's there to, to dispense his mercy is so beautiful. Um, so, yeah, mass you know, and confession. Yeah, I, I hear you. I, I mean, that was that was an eye. I was so nervous to go to my first confession and and I walked away feeling like this truck had been lifted off my chest because it was the first time yeah. in my life that I'd, I had truly been honest to God, to somebody else and to myself about my my walk with God and my sin life, you know, my sin and and everything. And it really forced me to be honest. And, you know, I, I'd love to hear from I'd love for our listeners to hear from your perspective, because I think I think nobody likes to go to confession, right? Because it's like, it's uncomfortable. Like here, I'm going to bear my soul to, you know, in front of the priest and it's going to be embarrassing and all of this stuff. What goes in your mind um, as you're listening to confession? Hmm. I say for one thing, yeah, it is wild being on the other side because, you know, even, even as a priest going to confession, sometimes there's a certain sense that you're kind of like, Oh, come on. Like, you know, I, I, I should have known better or did I do this? It's like, this is, this is kind of embarrassing, but, but as a priest, it's like part, part of the, um, so St. John Vianney says, um, the priesthood is the love of the sacred heart of Jesus. And, uh, and so as a priest, it's like the, the Lord really draws you into his, his deep love for sinners. It's like, it's not like he sinners were there and he withdrew from them. It's like, those are the people that he ran to meet. You know, it's like he, he went and sought the lost sheep and he, you know, it was like in wanting to, to save them from these sins is what, you know, motivated him to come to, to die, to suffer for us. Um, and so like, as priests, we have this real desire to lift the burden, you know, it's like, I, I don't know, is this maybe, maybe doctors, you know, spiritual physicians here, uh, connected to the grand physician, um, Maybe there's something similar for, for doctors that it's like, um, yeah, it's like they, they, they see sickness and they want to like, they like, if they know that they can, they can like bring the cure, they're like, oh my gosh, yeah, I see that. And like, I really want to, to, to help. And so in a certain way, it's like, yeah, as priests, it's like, um, we can see sometimes like people won't be hesitate to open up. We're just kind of like, like the Lord loves you so much. Like he has the cure. I receive the cure on a regular basis. I've seen many, many, many people cured. Just like, yes, just, just, just come to him and be open. And we're like, we're like ex- excited in a certain sense that it's like the Lord and, and he works. And sometimes it's amazing too, to see the power of the sacrament when you realize it's not, sometimes the Lord gives you wise words that are not your own. And you're like, wow, okay, that was there. And then there's other times it's like, yeah, you, you, you just see somebody comes in and they may start with a, you know, they're kind of like going to start like oh, going through the motions or, um, you know, they're, they're, they're hesitant or they'll have like a certain excuse, like, uh, you know, well, you know, th- th- there's this thing, but that's not really a sin, right? That's like, you know, in a little bit, you're like, kind of like, well, if you're bringing it up, you probably realize that it's, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's something there, but, but then you see in the process of that, the Lord like changes their hearts like in, in, in such a beautiful way and he's, and he's working. And uh, I don't know, it's, it's, it's like a privileged place to be, uh, to be able to just be like a, like kind of a, a fountain or a conduit of, of God's love, like healing people's souls. It's amazing. Hmm. I love that. I love that. Well, I've taken up so much of your time and I've thoroughly <laughs> enjoyed this conversation um, and I could ask a million more questions, but I, I kind of want to end with one question. So the, the the title of this podcast is called Why Catholic? And so I always like to end an interview by asking a question. If someone came up to you and said, All right, Father John Paul, like, um, why are you Catholic? Or why should I consider becoming Catholic? What, what would you say to them? Hmm. I would say the Catholic Church is the church founded by Jesus Christ. And it is what he founded specifically to unite you and every human person to himself. That is why the church exists, is for union with him. And he is present there, especially in the Eucharist, body, blood, soul, and divinity in a way that he is present nowhere else. And so it is the way he has chosen to give himself to us. And he wants you to be there with him. And there's nothing better than that.
It was so good catching up with Father John Paul, and before long, I realized we had been talking for an hour and a half, definitely one of my longer interviews and episodes. Father John Paul was so generous with his time, and I hope this interview helps you realize the sacrifice that these priests make to provide for the spiritual needs of the church. While there are exceptions to priestly celibacy, a topic for another day, the vast majority give up marriage and family in order to serve the people. As you heard from Father John Paul, priests spend hours and hours in prayer, in daily sacramental ministry, particularly leading Mass and hearing confession. They perform a litany of weddings and funerals, and also have to attend to the administrative needs, the budgets and emails and leaky faucets and roofs. Do me a favor, when you see your priest, especially in busy times like Christmas and Holy Week, ask him if there's anything you can provide for him, any way you can lighten his load, and especially pray for him. I want to thank Father John Paul for doing this interview and a special thank you to all the priests and those who have taken religious vows and live a life dedicated to serving the church. In the show notes, I've provided some links. One is to the Dominican Rosary Pilgrimage, which takes place on September 30th, 2023. I've also provided a link to the Dominican's Friar Foundation. There's also a link to an interview Father John Paul did with the Coming Home Network. And lastly, there are links to Father John Paul's social media accounts. I hope you'll check these out. Thank you for joining me for Why Catholic. Be sure to subscribe to Why Catholic wherever you get your podcasts. And you can also subscribe to my Substack site and get the next episode in your email inbox. As a subscriber, you get a special discount code to the Why Catholic Etsy store. If you've been blessed by this podcast and you're feeling generous, there's also a way to financially support it and patrons get some extra perks. To become a free subscriber or a patron, just go to whycatholic.substack.com slash subscribe. Also join me on Instagram at whycatholicpodcast, all one word. Thanks again for listening. My name is Justin Hibbard, and this is Why Catholic. God bless you.